Greetings, everyone. Konbanwa. Uh, this is the webinar on frontiers of protein science in Japan, brought to you by the Protein Society. My name is Liz Myring. I'm the president of the Protein Society, and it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the webinar today on this exciting topic that we're having with our longtime colleagues and partners in the field of protein science, uh, the Protein Science Society of Japan, or PSSJ. So before going to the details of the webinar, I would like to make a couple of announcements. So first, I would like to invite you to join us for the 38th Symposium of the Protein Society, which is taking place this year in Vancouver. So perhaps not such a long distance for many of you. We have a very exciting program and many travel awards uh, for young scientists. And you can find uh, the information on the symposium at our website. So we hope you will join us. Also, I want to highlight the journal that's with the, associated with our society, the Protein Science Journal, um, which is really flourishing under the wonderful leadership of John Curian and his editorial team. And I'd like to encourage everyone to consider publishing your own latest research in, in protein science. And now to our main event. I'd like to warmly thank Atsushi Nakagawa for organizing this wonderful set of speakers and for leading this webinar, even at this very late hour in Japan. We're honored and grateful to have Atsushi as a member of executive council in our society. And he's also the president of the Protein Science Society of Japan. He's a professor at Osaka University uh, at the Institute for Protein Research, where he's head of the Laboratory of Supermolecular Crystallography. Uh, one of the things that I deeply appreciate about being a protein scientist is working with researchers worldwide, dedicated researchers who are doing amazing research, such as Atsushi and our speakers today. And it's a real privilege to share and advance knowledge of proteins for the benefit of our, of our society. So this webinar is one way to do that. And I'm very much looking forward to this view of frontier protein science in Japan. I'd also like to thank our speakers today um, for sharing their research with us all. One more uh, comment is just that our webinar is also available afterwards on our YouTube channel. And uh, to facilitate this webinar, um, I'll just make a couple of notes. So each speaker is going to give a 20 minute presentation followed by a five minute question period. And after all the talks, we'll have another um, time, short time for questions in a discussion format among our speakers. So I'll encourage everyone to, in your Zoom meeting, look for your Q&A and you can type your questions at any time during any of the presentations. Only the organizers and the speakers will be able to see the questions. Uh, after they're answered, they will go into the chat. So the way that we'll take the questions is that um, Atsushi and speakers will read out questions and we won't be able to get to all of them in real time, but the speakers can also type answers to questions in the chat. So, I'd like to uh, also thank everyone in the audience for being here. Uh, your questions and participation are critical and so important in this um, activity. So please do share your thoughts with us. And I really, we really welcome the questions. And with that, I will um, turn this to Atsushi. Thanks again, Satushi. Atsushi. Okay. Thank you very much, Liz. That's all. Uh, welcome to the webinar. So I'm Atsushi Nakagawa from the Institute for Protein Research, Osaka University. As a president of the Protein Society, Science Society of Japan, I'd like to thank the Protein Society, especially the present Professor Liz Merring, uh, for giving us a chance to organize this webinar entitled uh, Frontiers of Pro Protein Science in Japan today. And the Protein Science Society of Japan, PSSJ, was originally or uh, officially established in 2001. However, it was established based on the three organizations of Protein Engineering Society of Japan, Forums on Protein Structures, and Principles of Protein Architecture. One of the three organizations 
forums on protein structures was established in 1950. Therefore, we can say that we have a long history. Now, PSJ, PSSJ had had a very good relationship with the Protein Society from the early stage of the establishment of the society. Uh, the former president, Professor Chris Dobson, proposed us to organize the joint symposium, and we decided to organize the international symposium jo joint with the fourth annual meeting of PSSJ in 2004. The first Pacific Rim International Conference on Protein Science at that time, ne the name was there, and the Brick. Oops, it's, it's very difficult to pronounce it. But the first day, uh, the international uh, conference was held in Yokohama. And then the second uh, the symposium was held in the Cairns in Australia at the first Asia Pacific Protein Association, APR, meeting. In 2020, PSSJ and TPS worked together to organize the 2020 World Conference on Protein Science and called the 2020 WCPS in Sapporo. Unfortunately, as many of you know, uh, that the conference was canceled because of the COVID-19. And this webinar is a good opportunity for tight interaction between the Protein Society and the Protein Society, Science Society of Japan after the pandemic. So today we invite four speakers who will present the frontiers of protein science in Japan from basic science to medical applications. I hope all, all of you will enjoy this webinar. So now let's start the webinar now. The first speaker is a Professor Eiko Nango from Tohoku University. She's working on a time-resolved protein structure analysis uh, called molecular movies using XFL facility circular in Japan. Uh, I, I heard that she collected uh, or worked at the on the beam line uh, it, it last, until last night. So uh, today the, uh, she's talking on the Time resolved serial femtosecond crystallography for enzymatic reaction analysis. So, Professor Nango, please. Thank you for a kind introduction. I'm Eriko Nango from Tohoku University. So, uh, before starting my talk, so let me introduce uh, our new uh, three uh, three giga electron volt ring termed nanoteras, uh, which is a, a synchrotron radiation facility. Oh, my computer, it doesn't work well. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it oh, doesn't work. Oh, just a minute. Oh, oh. Yes, so uh, Tohoku U University is located at the north area of Japan. Uh, Nanoteras was uh, constructed uh, at the at the Aobayama camp uh, at the uh, campus of Tohoku University. So, uh, this uh, this is a photo a photo of Nanoteras. So Nanoteras uh, is uh, so Nanoteras. Uh, uh, can emit uh, intense soft X-rays. So soft X-ray uh, strongly uh, uh, strongly uh, interacted with electron. So soft X-ray uh, excels at analysis of electron structure, uh, spectroscopy, and imaging. Uh, while hard X-ray excels at uh, analysis of atomic structure. So nanoteras uh, can provide a uh, hard X-ray also. We are now uh, preparing experimental hatch for protein crystallography there. We are excited that many users will come to nanoteras to obtain wonderful data. Uh, then uh, I will talk about uh, overview of time-resolved uh, serial femtosecond uh, femto crystallography and recent works at SAPRA today. 
So, uh, synchrotron radiation facilities have contributed to uh, protein structure determination. So, uh, since uh, the first uh, structure was determined, uh, uh, determined the number of deposited structures in protein data bank uh, in what uh, is increasing. The first synchrotron radiation facility was established uh, uh, in 1970s. So uh, improving synchrotron radiation facilities, uh, the number of uh, deposited uh, structures in PDB uh, also increased. So around uh, 2010, uh, the first X-ray free electron laser facility, LCLS, uh, was constructed. Uh, followed by Sakura in Japan. So recently, cryo-EM is a powerful tool for protein structure determination. Alpha Fold 2, which is a uh, structure uh, uh, prediction software, is also a powerful tool uh, for pre uh, structure uh, prediction. So far, uh, we, uh, we we can only see static structure from the uh, determined protein structure. Uh, however, uh, recently it's now possible to obtain a dynamic structure uh, using XFL and so on. In conventional X-ray crystallography, uh, most of data was uh, were collected under cryogenic condition to prevent uh, radiation damage by X-ray. Uh, cryogenic condition uh, is not physiological condition, so it's very hard to see uh, the function of protein. And then, uh, Previously, uh, X-ray uh, 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 X-ray data collection required a uh, long uh, X-ray exposure. So even though protein uh, functions uh, obtained data will be averaged structures, which is uh, difficult to see uh, protein dynamics at the atomic uh, level. So radiation damage uh, under cryogenic condition, it, uh, it is pre uh, it, uh, prevented uh, by cryogenic temperature. However, uh, some of proteins are uh, uh, still uh, caused by radiation damage. For example, uh, bac bacteriodopsin is very sensitive uh, uh, to radiation damage. Even though very low X-ray dose, it shows uh, the structural alteration as shown here. So radiation damage is a big problem in conventional X-ray crystallography. By the way, uh, are cryogenic structure true? So uh, most of structure uh, have been uh, collected under cryogenic temperature. However, uh, Recently, uh, structure at room temperature shows uh, uh, different uh, uh, conformation. So, uh, for example, uh, I'll talk about uh, our uh, data of hospitalized So, we collected two types of uh, uh, structure data. So, one is uh, structures at room temperature using X-ray free electron laser. The other is uh, cryogenic structure at synchrotrons. Looking at these uh, structures, uh, we found uh, the difference between uh, them. Uh, in the structure at room temperature, we uh, found the loop uh, in the active side was opened. On the other hand, uh, structure at cryogenic temperature showed uh, the loop uh, was closed in the active site. So uh, this enzyme is very uh, unique. Uh, uh, this enzyme catalyst unique uh, reaction. So uh, this enzyme catalyst multi uh, multiple uh, reaction as shown here. So. Uh, 
Firstly, uh, this enzyme uh, catalyzes uh, uh, react with fructose 6-phosphate, uh, which is a relatively larger substrate. And then uh, after releasing uh, water molecule, then uh, secondary the, uh, enzyme uh, uh, take uh, phosphate as a second substrate. So uh, we considered these two type uh, conformation of the loop showed a uh, uh, difference uh, for uh, taking uh, substrate. The open form uh, tend to uh, take a larger substrate like for, uh, fructose 6-phosphate. The closed form of loop uh, tend to uh, take a phosphate, which is a smaller substrate. So, uh, Cryogenic condition allows only capturing a metastate st uh, metastable state according to Boltzmann distribution. So indeed, unstable state cannot be observed under cryogenic condition. So uh, it has uh, it it has been uh, very challenging in observing protein uh, dynamics at uh, the atomic level. So to uh, visualize protein dynamics at atomic resolution, uh, Lowry method and cryotrapping crystallography have been used. However, uh, in Lowry method, uh, there is a technical technical limitation. So I'm showing the photograph of uh, diffraction pattern uh, of Lowry, uh, by Lowry method. You can see the very complicated diffraction pattern, which is very uh, hard to solve it. And then uh, cryotrapping method uh, is not time dependent. So uh, observed uh, intermediate structure might be limited. Uh, due to cryotherapy, uh, cryogenic uh, temperature. Then both uh, for both of method uh, uh, cause radiation damage uh, as shown here. So uh, indeed, uh, it has been challenging in observing protein dynamics at atomic resolution. So indeed, protein uh, move uh, 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 change structure with time. So uh, proteins react over a wide range uh, of time scale from femtosecond to uh, over a second. For example, uh, bond breaking occur uh, around the femtosecond and then uh, enzyme react uh, with substrate around uh, uh, microsecond or millisecond. So recently, uh, Time resolved serial femtosecond crystallography allows to uh, allows uh, observation uh, such a uh, such a reaction uh, from femtosecond to uh, sec over second, and then also synchrotron uh, synchrotron enables uh, observation of re uh, enzyme uh, protein reaction uh, after millisecond. Uh, today, uh, I'll focus on time-resolved serial femtosecond crystallography. Uh, this for photograph is uh, Sakura and Springate. So I have been uh, developed techniques for uh, protein determination by uh, using X-ray free electron laser termed X-file uh, since 20, uh, 2012. So X-ray free electron lasers have been uh, in practice uh, practical use since the beginning of this century. x fail has special characteristics of high peak brilliance, uh, high coherence, and ultra short pulse duration. Less than 10 second pulse is available at Sakura. This is uh, a simulation result of T4 lysozyme molecule. Once intense X-ray is irradiated to the molecule, uh, it will be explored around uh, uh, around 50 femtosecond after X-ray irradiation. However, diffraction phenomena uh, is completed before 10 femtosecond because the pulse is ultra short. 
Uh, this principle uh, is called uh, a diffraction before destruction. Uh, this principle uh, allows us to obtain pristine protein structure before the onset of radiation damage. Firstly, LCRS has started to use the operation followed by Sakura. To date, five x file facilities are available. In conventional X-ray crystallography, a single crystal is mounted and exposure by X-ray. The crystal is oscillated and rotated during data correction under cryogenic temperature to reconstruct three-dimensional structures. Serial femtosecond crystallography, termed SFX, is a new method for protein structure determination using X files. In SFX, myriad microcrystals are loaded into an injector and ejected from thin nozzle under room temperature. Diffraction patterns from randomly oriented microcrystals result in damage free protein structure. XFAIR also allows us to observe uh, protein dynamics at the atomic level by combining SFX with some kind of reaction initiator. There are mainly two type reaction triggering method. One is pump probe experiment. Uh, also, it's limited to hot active protein Usage of caged compound uh, may, uh, may make it possible. The, the other is a uh, mix and inject method. Crystal are mixed with substrate solution, and then the mixture is exposed by x file after certain uh, delay time. This method can be applied to various protein, uh, proteins such as enzymes and receptors. First, I uh, introduce our result from home probe experiments briefly. For the experiment, we used bacteriodopsin, which is a light driven proton pump uh, from uh, Haroarchia. This protein has uh, seven transmembrane helices and contains retinal chromophore as shown here. After light illumination, the retinal undergoes uh, isomerization from trans to synthesis form, initiating photocycle. The protein forms KLMN. O intermediate with different uh, maximum absorption and return to the resting state. During the photocycle, proton is transported from uh, cytoplasmic side to extracellular uh, side. This flow is unidirectional, uh, unidi unidirectional. The primary proton transfer occur at uh, uh, the shift base of the retinal, and the proton is transported uh, aspartate 85. We prepared the bacteriodopsin crystal to perform time resolved SFX experiment. Lipidic cubic phase is a crystallization method uh, using lipid for membrane protein. We developed the experimental setup for the experiment at Sakura. Uh, this is a sample stream from an uh, injector. Uh, this side is around 75 micrometer, very thin uh, stream. A sample stream from the injector was initiated by a pump laser and then exposed to x file after a certain delay time. We obtained a snapshot with a different timing by changing a delay time. Merging the data provide molecular movies of bacteriodopsin. Let's see a movie of bacteriodopsin. Uh, fi finally, we collected uh, data from 16 nanosecond to 1.7 millisecond after right illumination. The 13 structures were classified into four types, K, L, REM, rate M. 
So uh, this is a video of a proton transfer in bacteriodopsin. The red color model indicate an intermediate and the purple model is the resting state of bacteriodopsin. So let's see the video. The retina firstly isomerized and then the water molecule was dislodged. You can see movement of each amino acid residues with time. What advantage are there to observing structural changes as moving uh, uh, molecular movement? It's observation of a transient event. The figure on the left side shows electron density changes between the resting state and the intermediate. Uh, these map indicate uh, uh, so uh, clearly we see the uh, difference between uh, the resting state and the intermediate. So uh, based on these uh, electron density change, change uh, we modeled a uh, structure. Uh, please see the figure on the right side. The red model uh, is the intermediate structure at 760 nanoseconds after light illumination. We found the transient water molecule at 760 nanoseconds uh, after uh, light illumination. So uh, this uh, water molecule appeared at uh, this timing around the shift base of the retina. The water molecule was observed from 40 nanosecond to 13.8 microsecond. This result is time resolved spectrometry of uh, on bacteriodopsin crystals, which indicate that L intermediate is dominant at one microsecond and M intermediate is dominant at one millisecond. M intermediate is the timing for the uh, primary proton transfer. Therefore, the timing of 760 nanosecond uh, means before the primary proton transfer step of bacteriodopsin, the water molecule interact with the shift base proton and threonine 89 connecting aspartate 85 via hydrogen bonding. Also, the proton of the shift base turns toward a cytoplasmic side by a photoisomerization. The shift base comes in contact with aspartate 85 via the transient water molecule. Uh, at, when we conducted, uh, we obtained this data, we couldn't see any proton uh, and hydrogen atom by X-ray. So as you know, uh, X-ray cannot show uh, proton and it, uh, pro uh, it's very difficult to see hydrogen atom by X-ray. So we uh, could not uh, mention about the reaction mechanism of proton transfer in detail at that time. After that, uh, Dr. Ono at Carrick uh, conducted uh, uh, quantum mechanical, uh, me uh, mechanical metadynamics simulations uh, or using our time-resolved data. So they considered three pathways uh, for primary trans. Uh, primary uh, proton transfer. So uh, they uh, showed the energy to, uh, landscape of uh, the pathway. The most uh, plausible pathway was this pathway. So firstly, uh, the water molecule uh, became a uh, hydro, uh, hydroxide ion, and then uh, the proton uh, is transferred to aspartate 85, uh, finally, OH minus ion uh, takes uh, proton from a uh, shift base. Uh, this uh, pathway is energetically advantageous. So, uh, finally, so I explain about uh, mix and inject uh, experiment. So, recently, uh, 
So I skip it. So uh, recently we conducted Vix and the inject experiment using uh, this type uh, device uh, of uh, this type device, uh, microfluidics device. Uh, however, it required a lot of uh, sample uh, crystals, uh, over 100 milligram uh, protein crystal. So we uh, wanted to uh, improve this method. So we uh, constructed a new device. This is our new device, uh, tape drive, uh, drive setup for sample delivery. So uh, this tape, it's uh, this tape drive is a uh, transported uh, droplet uh, to XFEL uh, interaction uh, region. So uh, previously, uh, Fura and Karik uh, developed this uh, this type uh, device, uh, 2070. Uh, however, uh, this type is different from ours. Uh, the droplet is irradiated parallel to the tape by uh, x ray uh, as shown here. So uh, this type requires the height of droplet. In our setup, uh, the x ray irradiate uh, per perpendicular to the tape. So uh, uh, this uh, method uh, doesn't require the height of droplet uh, reducing a sample amount. So uh, let's see the video of droplet. So just a minute. I want to play video. So the first droplet uh, ejected uh, here, and then uh, the substrate uh, droplet is uh, uh, added to the first droplet. So uh, this is a movie of a belt conveyor system. Using strobolite, uh, you can see the uh, uh, droplet uh, which it, uh, it stopped. However, it's uh, actually moving uh, by uh, tape drive. So uh, we uh, set uh, this droplet at a different position. However, uh, to align it, uh, this droplet becomes uh, one droplet. So uh, we can uh, add uh, protein crystal to the uh, substrate droplet. So using uh, lysozyme crystals uh, with, sorry, so my, I want to show power laser pointer. Okay, so uh, we use lysozyme crystal uh, with an N acetyl glucosamine, which is a, a substrate uh, uh, using this, uh, device. Using three to five micron lysozyme crystals, uh, we add a uh, N-acetyl glucosamine substrate uh, uh, to the droplet. So uh, firstly, uh, two seconds uh, after mixing, uh, no signal in the active site. After five seconds, we can see the clear map in the active site. So this ligand was starting to bind before a five second of mixing time. Then we use smaller crystal, one micrometer size. So we added uh, the ligand uh, to the crystals. And then uh, in this case, we can observe uh, the binding uh, of the ligand uh, to the active site uh, at 1.3 seconds after mixing. So the binding efficiency increased with smaller size crystals. So let's see the graph of uh, mixing timelines. So this uh, vertical axis means uh, occupancy of ligand. Uh, this is uh, delay time. So blue color means larger crystal, three to five micron crystal. So uh, with time, uh, slowly uh, peak uh, intensity uh, increased. On the other hand, smaller crystals, uh, occupancy, uh, occupancy of ligand in smaller crystals uh, rapidly uh, increased with time. 
And so we uh, used the higher concentration of ligand uh, with one micro uh, one microcrystal, so its uh, uh, occupancy is rapidly uh, increased. So uh, uh, this method, uh, I expect uh, this method uh, 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 is useful to observe enzymatic reaction process at the atomic uh, level. Okay, this is a, a summary of my talk. Uh, SFX, serial femtocrystallography at a room temperature enables the visualization of actual structure near physiological temperature. Second, time-resolved SFX can reveal reaction process as a molecular movie, including a transient event. Third, Simulation based on time-resolved data is a powerful method to interpret reaction mechanism. So, uh, I acknowledge my colleague involved in the mixing experiment. Uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Nango-san. So, uh, we have one question now. I have, yeah, I have a question about X-ray crystallography at low temperatures. Some dynamically low entropy conformation should be stabilized at low temperatures. Do the structure groups trapped by crystal freezing reflect the conformational ensemble inside the crystal just before freezing? Otherwise, when the temperature inside the crystal de decreases, does the conformational ensemble also change from closed to open? Okay, uh, thank you for your question. Low entropy conformation should be stabilized. Oh, I don't think low entropy conformation should be stabilized at the temperature. Um, the crystal I regret conformation. Um, so uh, actually, so we um, demonstrated uh, a comparison of cryotrapping and SFX. So uh, recently we developed cold SFX system under four degree. So uh, we uh, prepared enzyme uh, crystals uh, at four degree and at a substrate under four degree, then uh, subjected uh, it to SFX experiment. So we clearly observed intermediate, several intermediate in the active site of enzyme. However, cryotrapping method cannot show uh, such an intermediate. I believe uh, a higher uh, uh, unstable uh, intermediate cannot cannot seen uh, at low temperature, uh, like cryotrapping experiment. Okay, thank you. One more question. One question, and the other question is, and in bacterial rhodopsin, do any water molecules appear and disappear in that pocket, or are these structurally conserved waters that rearrange during the cycles? Oh. Oh, okay, good question. So, uh, <laughs> I want to show my slide, uh, it, but uh, time is limited. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, a water molecule near the sieve base disappeared uh, after uh, isomerization of the retinal, and then uh, a new water molecule appeared, uh, the Sereoni 89. So, uh, the several water molecules disappeared and appeared, but I don't know which water molecule is consistent with uh, the water molecule, so it's uh, difficult to say. Uh, real water, real energy in the cycle. Um, structurally, uh, structurally conserved waters. Um, yeah, it's a uh, difficult question. Anyway, so uh, in the uh, around the retinal, uh, the 
a water molecule, uh, several water molecules bind to the uh, amino acid around the uh, retina. So some water disappeared, some water uh, uh, appeared, but uh, so uh, its relationship, uh, I don't know. So sorry. Okay, thank you. And we have one more question, but uh, I'm sorry we don't have a time. So, Ango san, please uh, re reply, answer the questions on. Okay. By chat. Okay, okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eric Korn. So, thank you, Bacha again. Thank you so much. Okay. So, the next speaker is Professor Satoshi Takahashi from, again, Tohoku University. Uh, he's an expert of molecular folding and molecular interaction of proteins. The title of his talk is A Single Molecule single molecule threat and FCS investigation of the interaction between SARS-CoV-2 and protein and RNA. So Professor Takahashi, please. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, my name is Satoshi Takahashi from Tokyo University and thank you for today's chance. So this is my life career. <laughs> so, uh, this is my self-introduction, and I got my PhD in Okazaki Institute for Molecular Science. Then I, I went to United States, and I did my postdoc with Dennis Russo at at and And uh, I stayed there about two and a half years. Then I returned to Japan and go to Kyoto University and also Osaka University. And at that time, I worked with uh, Yuji Goto. And then about in 2009, I settled in the current uh, uh, Tohoku University in Sendai City. So uh, definitely the best, one of the best moment of my life is my postdoc days in the United States. So I could concentrate on the research and also I could enjoy uh, a discussion with my boss and uh, also, the second of my important moment uh, of my life is my experience as an executive counselor in the Protein Society. And I, uh, I was a counselor from 2018 to 2020. And I could learn how American scientists organize the societies and also how they discuss uh, creatively uh, and uh, for, to de determine the direction of the societies. So I really appreciate the way of a protein society policy to have international member in the executive council meeting, uh, council members. Okay. So uh, after returning to Japan, I worked uh, as a spectroscopist uh, to study the protein folding dynamics. And uh, this is one of my early achievement. And uh, at this time, uh, I studied the, how the collapse of the protein molecules proceed in the folding process. So this is the radiopsy gyration, and uh, this is secondary structure content. And I observed the protein collapse and also the alpha helix or beta sheet formation occurs in stepwise manner in, in these three protein systems. And uh, this radius gyration uh, corresponds to the formation of the non-local contact in proteins. And the secondary structure content corresponds to the local uh, contacts in protein structures. So I could understand the interplay of those two interactions that are essential to understand the structure formation in proteins. Okay, so more recently, I'm using a single molecule fluorescence spectroscopy. And uh, this is my, one of my recent work. And uh, uh, we updated our single molecule systems to the more recent, uh, more modern uh, Alex type uh, uh, detection systems. And uh, this is another recent work. Uh, so 
we improved, uh, slightly improved the ultra fast uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. And we could determine the nanosecond dynamics of the protein chains in the unfolded state. So, but today I decided to present our unpublished work, but uh, uh, the report uh, describing the today's topic was uh, almost nearly uh, close to the submission. So I decided to present this work. So the topic is about the N protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So N protein is a dimer of the 420, uh, 419 amino acid residues. And it has a folded domain, C terminal domain and uh, N terminal domain, uh, which are flanked by the, uh, which are connected by the uh, disordered region. And this N protein is inside of the coronavirus and binds to the genomic RNA and protect this RNA molecules. And in addition, so it was suggested that this N protein might form a, a liquid droplet in, in the cytosol of the host cell and to make complex with the, uh, with the genomic RNA. And sadly, it is suggested this N protein might help the selection of a single uh, genomic RNA to be packed inside of the uh, virus. So, uh, uh, the way uh, N protein interact in, uh, with the genomic RNA inside the uh, virus is not known yet. So these are the early data, uh, crystallographic data by a Taiwanese group and uh, during the SARS-CoV-1 period. And uh, uh, this is uh, very nice work. And they suggested, they found in the crystals of the N protein, the some spiral uh, structures are formed. So they proposed it, the RNA, may be wound around this uh, N protein load. But the more recent uh, cryo-EM data shows uh, more granular type structures inside of the virus. And uh, this is apparently the ribonucleotide protein complex. And the diameter of this granule is about uh, 15 nanometer. And uh, uh, these researchers suggested that this uh, this unit corresponds to the N protein dimer, so uh, RNA and uh, N proteins are making some small uh, compact structures. But in the separate work, it is well known that the uh, genomic RNA are making a lot of stem loops. So if these models are correct, then we need to assume that the N protein might unwind the secondary structures of the genomic RNA, but uh, the detailed structure uh, we still do not know. And another question about the N protein is uh, if we mix uh, N protein with a uh, relatively short strand of the RNA, then we can easily observe the droplet formation. So several people uh, propose that the before the formation of the ribonucleoprotein uh, complex, maybe some uh, droplet uh, might be formed. But uh, this is another cryo-EM work, and uh, uh, they observe the uh, ribonp particles are already formed inside the cytosol, uh, apparently without involving the droplet. So, Another question is, is this LPS is really involved in the formation of the RNP or not? And finally, uh, it is said that this N protein might also be involved in the packaging of the bio, uh, uh, genomic RNA. So inside of the virus, uh, we can find only one molecule of uh, genomic RNA. No other RNAs are uh, inside of the virus. So this is a call, this is a call, this is a, a problem called the packaging problem. 
and uh, some hypothesis for this package, selective packaging is the maybe a specific sequence in the genomic RNA called uh, pa packaging signal. And this packaging signal might be recognized by this N protein and enabling the uh, selection of only one RNA molecules. So there are many questions to be, uh, which are not still answered uh, for the structures of the genomic RNA. And so, but those, uh, those questions are all related to the molecular uh, interactions, molecular detail of the interaction between N and uh, RNA. So in this work, uh, we decided to use uh, single molecule flat spectroscopy and also FCS, uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So to understand the uh, uh, mechanism of the uh, molecular interactions. So we used, uh, uh, so in the first part of the work, we used relatively short RNA strands. So uh, uh, this is poly polyadenylate uh, 40. So this is a single strand RNA uh, 40 base. And so we also prepared 30 base and 20 base. Also, as an example of the stem loops, uh, we prepare SL4. Uh, this is the sequence we took from the genomic RNA. And also, we prepared other two stem loop structures. And those latter two are selected from the hypothetical uh, packaging signal of the genomic RNA. So this is our early result. So when we try the single molecule measurement, uh, so this is a time and uh, this is a photon count uh, at the single molecule level. So in the absence of the uh, N protein, we could observe a single molecule burst easily. But when we begin to add the N protein, then uh, we could observe very long burst and uh, this likely corresponds to the aggregate of the protein and a uh, short RNA fragment. And also, uh, but in those days, uh, we couldn't get reproducible result. And uh, as we repeated uh, over our experiments, uh, we realized that the, uh, the data reproducibility is actually uh, dependent on the uh, quality of the end protein samples. So it is essentially important to uh, wash the uh, uh, N protein samples uh, uh, by using the ribonuclease to eliminate uh, contamination of the uh, uh, RNA or DNA uh, from the uh, E. coli. So uh, after complete washing of the samples, uh, we could see the uh, clear absorbance peak and or CD and uh, also the reproducibility of the data becomes uh, 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 we could achieve the good reproducibility of the experimental data. Okay, so this is the first result. So we 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 were surprised that the after the purification of the N protein, then we could observe the CD spectra quite easily. So we need to use micromolar solution, or, but even at these concentrations, we don't see any uh, turbidity in the samples. So uh, this is a CD uh, uh, of the polyadenylate adenylic acid uh, 40 and N protein. And, uh, uh, we subtracted N protein CD from the, uh, the data. So this is a, a CD spectrum corresponding to the RNA portion. So here uh, we could see this derivative pattern and corresponding to the single stranded and also uh, helical structures. But uh, uh, the small change of the amplitude suggests the structure of the single uh, strand RNA might be modulated. But uh, when we uh, mix uh, stem loop and end protein, then CD spectrum does not change at all. 
and this positive peak uh, is an indication of the, uh, the double strand in the RNA. So we can see that the uh, N protein does not unwind the double strand of the uh, stem loops. Okay, then we used the single molecule flat spectroscopy. So for this, we attach donand acceptor fluorophores and at the short distance of the donand acceptor, we could see the larger uh, uh, frequency close to one. But if the distance are separated, frequency should be low. And uh, for the flat measurement, uh, we uh, introduced the uh, Alex measurement system, which was originally developed by Simon Weiss. And uh, for this measurement, uh, we introduced two lasers, lasers for the donor fluorophore excitation and laser for the acceptor flora excitation alternatively. And uh, so by using this method, uh, we can select the samples having both donor and acceptor uh, uh, in one molecule. If uh, the molecule has only donor or only acceptor, uh, uh, that this uh, Alex method can eliminate those uh, uh, single level samples. Okay, and furthermore, uh, we introduced the flat burst software, uh, which is also developed by Simon Weiss group and also his collaborators. And to do the, try the comprehensive data analysis of the single molecule data. Okay, so this is the result. So uh, uh, A40 sample uh, is single strand also the donor acceptor distance is very long. So the free efficiency is low. But after the binding with N protein, so the, the peak becomes quite broad. Also, the uh, components having higher free efficiency uh, appeared. So this uh, indicate that the uh, N protein, binding of the N protein shrinks the uh, RA40. And this is the data for the binding of the end protein with SL4. So <clears throat> uh, uh, the binding uh, also causes a broadening of the efficiency distribution. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, before the addition of the end protein, uh, SL, donor acceptor distance for SL4 is short. So efficiency is quite high but the binding of the end protein causes broadening, but still the peak efficiency is quite high. So uh, end protein might change slightly on the double strand, but uh, uh, we can assume that uh, uh, stem structure is still mainly uh, maintained. So uh, the data by single molecule thread and also the CD data might seem contradictory, but we suggest that the binding of the N protein might inhibit the rotation of the fluorophore in the stem loops. So that can easily cause the broadening of the flatescency peak. Okay, then uh, we checked the brightness of the each burst. So when we try the single molecule measurement, we can see these peaks, these are the burst and corresponding to the single molecules, but then uh, for each burst, we can calculate the rate of the photon detection, which corresponds to the intensity, fluorescence intensity, and also correspond to the number of the fluorophore in the burst. And uh, so, uh, so if the, uh, this brightness is larger, maybe we can assume that this particle may come from, uh, may contain two fluorescent molecules. So this axis corresponds to the brightness. So by uh, checking this distribution, we can guess the uh, stoichiometry of the binding uh, with uh, N protein. So this is the data for the A40. 
So uh, this red distribution is for, for the, uh, in the absence of the N protein, and it has a single peak at about this five kilo count per second. But as we add the N protein, uh, this peak decreases, but the peak having a higher brightness increased. So this apparently suggests that uh, uh, association of two molecules of the RNA to single uh, uh, to uh, uh, single dimer of N proteins. And similar observations uh, uh, we confirmed for SL4. And these are the list of the data for other samples. So A30, A20. So both have very similar result to A40. Also, these are the other stem loops. So although these stem loops are one of the hypothetical uh, packaging signal, but the result, uh, flat result, was very similar to that of the SL4. OK. So then uh, we tried the FCS measurement of the double level sample. But for this measurement, uh, we noticed that the donor fluorophore is slightly quenched by addition of the N protein. So we look at the FCS data was uh, uh, acceptor fluorophore. So uh, uh, this is a measurement very similar to the spread, but uh, uh, we have a sample here and we apply laser light and the fluorescence intensity fluctuation corresponds to the uh, hydrodynamic radius of the sample. So we can, uh, uh, we can see how compact the sample is. So, Again, uh, these are the data for A40, and this is the data for SL4. So for this short RNA, uh, actually, N protein is much larger. So the binding of the N protein uh, causes uh, la uh, uh, expansion of the RG uh, RH. OK, but then uh, by using FCS, we can also determine the brightness of the molecules, uh, and uh, we could again observe that increase of the brightness then decrease. So this result uh, is another evidence showing the stoichiometry of the binding between uh, N protein and the RNA change. So these data uh, uh, clearly show that the uh, the binding of the RNA and N protein might proceed in this three state model. Okay, so this is a summary of the data, and we'll discuss that uh, each question I have in the introduction. So, firstly, the, uh, does RNA show helical structure in RNAP? And apparently, the answer is no. So uh, uh, if the helical model is correct, uh, we may expect some uh, 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 systematic change for the uh, flat efficiency data for a 40, 30 to 20, but the result for all those three samples are very similar to each other. And this more likely suggests that the binding of the RNA and N protein occurs more non specifically. And then, can N unwind the secondary structure of RNA? And it is also no, uh, because we could observe very clear CD data before and after the binding with N protein. And uh, is LLPS involved in the formation of RNAP? And uh, probably no. So many reports suggest the um, aggregate uh, droplet formation by mixing of the N protein and RNA, but uh, we believe, uh, we think uh, many, some of them might be uh, caused by small amount of the impurities. And then uh, about the packaging signal. So we feel this packaging signal may is not, uh, Maybe unlikely. So, because the association of N protein R RNA uh, looks quite non specific. And uh, so, 
But、uh, this packaging hypothesis assumes very specific、uh, interaction between N and stem loops, and we feel it is less likely. So, then what is the role of the N protein? So,、uh, this is a secondary structure map of the entire genomic RNA of the coronavirus, and this is determined for the、uh, virus itself. So,、uh, We can see there are many、uh, secondary structures in the RNA. But then, if we look at this,、uh, th this pattern carefully, then we could see there may be some domain in this、uh, secondary structure patterns. So, and if we count the number of those domains, that、uh, almost corresponds to the number of the、uh, RNA complex inside of the coronavirus. It is assumed to be between 35 to 40. So, uh, uh, so currently, we have a hypothesis that the, maybe those genomic RNA granules might be formed by the folding. Of the、uh, RNA. So, this RNA particle, the structure of the particle may be coded in the sequence of the genomic RNA. And N protein、uh, promotes a collapse of the genomic RNA by bringing two、uh, stem loop d o m a i n of the RNA across each other. So, this is the idea from my earlier work. So, collapse. Uh, is important for the protein folding. So maybe N protein is the、uh, promoter of the collapse. So this is our more recent、uh, preliminary result. So we prepared a very long、uh, fragment of the genomic RNA. So this is the data、uh, of the、uh, 800. We prepared initial 800 bases of the genomic RNA. And put the fluorophore to the、uh, five prime terminus of the and try the FCS measurement. And、uh, this, is, uh, this is the concentration of the N protein, this is RH. And we could observe the increase of the RH, then decrease at、uh, higher N protein concentration like 10 micromolar. And this is a concentration we can assume uh, uh, inside of the coronavirus. So, okay, so, and also the temporal increase、uh, apparently、uh, is caused by the uh, accumulation, uh, uh, aggregation of several RNA molecules. Okay, so this is my conclusion. So,、uh, we suggest that the、uh, formation of the RNAP might,、uh, is quite likely. The process of the folding of the RNA and N protein、uh, helps the compaction of the RNA molecules. So, I want to thank to my students and also staff members of my laboratory and for、uh, many experiments.、Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very nice talk and very interesting talk. But I'm sorry we don't have enough time to accept the, the questions. So, if you have any questions, <laughs> if the audience has some questions, please、uh, type in the q a n d a session. So, I think Takashi san will re respond to you. Okay, thank you very much, Hen Satoshi. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Professor Katsumi Maenaka from. Hokkaido University.、Uh, he's working on protein and virus structures using a cloud EM,、uh, that it, uh, which is installed in the Biosafety P3 level facility in Hokkaido. The title of his talk is on Cloud EM facilities in Hokkaido University for antiviral drug and vaccine development. So, Professor Mainaka, please.、Uh, Professor、uh, Atsushi Nakagawa, thank you very much for kind and introduction. And I would like to thank again the, the organizers of the Protein Society, especially t h e e a s t and、uh, Dakota, the, to help me to give a talk here. And uh, uh, today my talk is、uh, focusing on the Cloud University in Hokkaido University. 
especially for the anti antiviral drug and vaccine development. Uh, I should say that I am Katami America from the pharmaceutical, uh, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences in Hokkaido University. So in Hokkaido University, uh, we have a scheme for the anti-academic uh, drug discovery. Uh, our group is very much interested in the surface molecules of the cells, skins, and microbes. We call the, these molecules as the biosurface molecules. Because the biosurface molecule is uh, uh, sort of the, uh, composed of the front lines uh, communicating with the cells or microbes. So that event, those events are very much important for the biological function. So we would like to know that the more detailed structural aspect using the cryo EM facilities. And also we use that uh, uh, the library, uh, uh, original libraries, including the wide range of the drug modality from low molecule weight components with the molecule and biologics. We combine the, this technique to achieve that academic drug discovery. So today's my talk is focusing on the, the COVID-19. Uh, as you probably know, uh, many people know about that the ta drug target uh, site of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, there are uh, several steps are important for drug targets. So as you can see here, the receptor uh, binding and also produce cleavage and RNA depend RNA polymers. This my talk is focusing on the uh, the receptor binding step. So focusing on the neutralizing antibodies target for the spike protein. The SARS CoV two has uh, the spike proteins on the viral surface. So spike proteins attached to the uh, human host cell uh, receptor host factor, uh, the ACE two receptor. The structure itself, the spike protein has the three uh, trimers, and uh, there are the, uh, the several domains. The important domain is uh, RBD receptor binding domain because the receptor binding domain uh, uh, up the conformation uh, to access to the ACE two receptor. So this is a mechanism of the anti SARS CoV two neutralizing antibodies. As I say, that the uh, RBD exposed to the receptor binding, but uh, uh, the antibodies that recognize the RBD is quite likely to have a potential to inhibit the virus binding to ACE2 uh, to achieve the neutralizing activity. So today I would like to uh, briefly explain about that uh, uh, several cross-reactive uh, RBD antibodies. So we have a three set of the series, MT series, UT series, and NIB series. The first I would like to introduce the MT series, MT193 antibody. So uh, my collaborator, the, the Dr. Takahashi of the National Institute of Infectious Diseases, and also Dr. Hashiguchi of the Kyoto University, they uh, started working on the, the, uh, the immunized the, uh, special mice that that mice uh, uh, can produce the fully human antibodies. So they immunize it uh, using that, uh, I immunize the recombinant RBD protein to mice and to get the B cells and the B cell uh, the selected by the uh, RBD S protein Bs. And single cells in, uh, using the single cell culture method they developed that uh, uh, monoclonal antibody panels, so including the more than 300 monoclonal antibodies. The, uh, the cross reactivity, uh, uh, the MT193 clearly shows that the wide range of the cross reactivity. So today I focus on the, this antibody. MT193 is a cross uh, neutralizer, the SARS CoV 1. So first, I should say that the uh, NT193 uh, creates showing that the uh, potent neutralizing activity. So you, as you can see here, vertical access to neutralizing, uh, neutralizing activity and the 
less than axis is the concentration. You can see the high, uh, very low the concentration still has a, a very high uh, neutral activity. So NT193 red lines is uh, similar to the uh, famous regenerative antibodies. So yeah, as you can see here that this is a shield called SARS-CoV-2. This is authentic SARS-CoV-2. So similar level we can see uh, for the uh, neutralizing activity. And in addition, NT193 uh, neutralizes SARS-CoV-1. So th that is also important point. So NT193 exhibit high neutralizing activity and excellent uh, CoV-1 cross neutralizing ability. Uh, in addition, we perform that uh, in vivo evaluation using hamster models, uh, clearly showing that uh, NT193 has a therapeutic effect. Next, we would like to uh, understand the structure aspect of NT193. We successfully got the crystal and got the data, and we uh, determined the uh, crystal structure of NT193 compared with RBD. And collaboration with the KEK synchrotron radiation in SCUBA. And as you can clearly see that the uh, NT193 binds to the RBD head at a similar mode to the ACE2. So NT193 sort of mimic the ACE2 binding. More details think I would like to see. The, and this is RBD surfaces here. And uh, as you can see that the cyan showing that uh, is to binding area. So red, uh, red circle is showing that uh, light chain recognition epitope and black is uh, heavy chain recognition cell. So the light chain uh, masks the uh, ACE2 binding sites. On the other hand, heavy chain recognizes the uh, uh, conserved area. Conserved means that uh, uh, the this yellow lesion uh, corresponding to the conserved width between the, the SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. The orange is similar and the gray is this different. So as you, uh, you can clearly see that the heavy chain recognizes the uh, conserved area. So finally, MT193 uses the heavy chain and light chain and the distinct function. So, to achieve the high neutralizing activity and cross reactivity. Next antibody I would like to show that the UT28K. So this is a collaboration with uh, uh, Toyama University. So NT28K derived from the uh, COVID-19 conversions individuals. Uh, so UT28K uh, show that uh, uh, very good the neutralizing activity towards the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and uh, BA1 of omicron. And we would like to know that the uh, structure aspect, such features of UDIN 28K using the cryo EM and X-ray crystallography studies. So first, I would like to show you the cryo EM structure of the FAB UD 28K bound to SARS-CoV-2 as spike protein. Uh, Okada University uh, has a uh, 300 kb cryos at the normal area. And we successfully go to the data. So as you can see here, that the spike protein uh, trimer, the three up RBD bound to the UT28K FAB. And as you can see here, the RBD and the 28K FAB recognition. But unfortunately, we can only go to the five ohms of resolution. So we first uh, uh, try to get the crystal structure and successfully we got the data for the, uh, this complex, uh, the UT28K and RVD complex and the resolution is 3.75 Armstrong. And that is why we can discuss a more detail the recognition site. As you can see here, the UT28K FAB recognizes a penal 486 and tyrosine 489. So this top side, uh, can be uh, recognized by the UT28K. And this recognition mode is uh, uh, similar to the, the other, uh, the same, uh, the uh, other public clone type, uh, IGHB158, IGKV320 pairing monogram antibody. So this clone type is showing that the similar binding mode and especially focusing on the 
uh, the class one super side, well conserved side of the RVD. Next, I would like to move on to the NIV NIB series. This is a NIB antibody derived from the COVID-19 conversions, uh, but uh, these patients uh, are the infected uh, are the, uh, uh, seven months after infection of the Omicron. So we uh, successfully go to the three antibodies, and uh, NIB 10, 11, 13, and successfully got the clarium structure. And we also work in the X-ray uh, structure for the RBDFAB complex for the uh, NIB-10 because the uh, NIB-10 is a bit lower resolution for the clarium. So neutral activity for the NIB-10, 11, and 13, we would like to see. Uh, as you can see here, that the NIB-11 uh, show that uh, uh, the Free and neutralizing activity towards the BA1 and BA2, and NIB30 is uh, the higher uh, neutralizing activity to BA1, BA2, but unfortunately, the uh, NIB11 is reduced the neutralizing activity towards the BA45, and NIB30 is a completely lost of the neutralizing activity. And uh, from the structures, so NIB11 epitopes is uh, 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 the focusing on the class one super side, but a little bit wire and the uh, NIB30 that much smaller than focusing on the class one super side. So BA45 is a carrier and the point mutation, the important panel on 486 to the belly. That mutation is a significant effect that usually the activity of the NIB11, NIB13. On the other hand, NIB10, uh, that has uh, uh, the neutralizing activity toward the BA12, and uh, fortunately, the NIB10 uh, also detained the neutralizing activity toward the BA45. So we uh, checked the detailed recognition of the NIB10 and NIB11. As you can see, the failure of 486 uh, tightly packed in the N NIB11, but the uh, NIB10 has a, uh, there are some spaces around the fairly in 486 in the NIB complex. Uh, that if I, NIB10 has a loose contact with fairly in 486 and the NIB11, NIB that is why that uh, NIB10 uh, can be tolerant uh, to fairly in 486 very mutation. I would like to summarize that uh, the active transition of the selected RBD antibodies. So first, we determined the NT196, and uh, that is uh, uh, coming from so the human antibody producing mice. And the uh, epitope is wide, and neutralizing activity is high, but uh, only effective for the, uh, the, uh, until the delta. And the next one is uh, our conversion patients, uh, the UD28K, the focusing on the super side epitope, so get the effect of the BA1. And next one is NIB13, the much smaller epitope uh, concentrated on the uh, super side, and around 486, but that is not effective anymore for the BA45. So finally, NIB10, uh, the bigger epitope, uh, including the around 486, but that is uh, uh, the effective for the BA45. So in summary, the, uh, the still variants such as the XBB, EG5.1, BA286 are emerging. So and cross reactive antibody designs are targeting the vulnerable site, so such as the super site, but not sufficient. Uh, we can see that these result. So in this sense that uh, I would like to move back on that uh, the NT193, because the NT193 is cross reactive to the far from that the SARS CoV 1, uh, CoV 2. So SARS CoV 1 uh, can be recognized by the NT193. So I would like to carefully look around at uh, why the NT193 can neutralize the SARS CoV 1. So important one is uh, uh, the uh, NT193, the the first, the IgG1, 
the isotype uh, they uh, show that the less neutralizing activity but uh, in the IgG3 isotype showed much higher neutralizing activity. So in this case that uh, uh, we also checked that the same class one antibody such as the uh, zero one uh, on 0933 also show that the <clears throat> similar effect. So we checked again the uh, more detail. So NT193, uh, sorry, NT193 FAB recognizes uh, that SARS-CoV-2 already very strongly, but uh, uh, less uh, uh, reduces binding affinity towards the SARS-CoV-1 already. But as you can see here, with regards to the neutralizing activity, NT193 showed improved activity towards the SARS-CoV-1. Uh, in the IgG3, IgG3 isotype similar to the SARS-CoV-2. So NT193 FAB showed the reducing binding uh, RBD. However, IgG4 format uh, improves the potent neutral activity, but uh, IgG1 did not. So the important point is the cross reactivity can be achieved with uh, uh, the weak interaction combined with the probability effect. I would like to discuss about more detail on why the TNT-193 IgG3 format uh, can be effective for the SARS-CoV-1. The spike proteins on, are reported to be located distantly on the viral surfaces. This result may suggest that there is existed the appropriate distance of spike proteins and antibody recognition mode, which fits the longer uh, arms of IgC3 and not to the shorter uh, arms of the IgG1. Probably this is a reason to achieve that uh, significant uh, neutralizing activity. So in this case, that uh, we can carefully think about that uh, combination of the weak interaction and the ability and orientation to achieve the cross reactivity. So we move back here, and uh, as I say that. Uh, Still variants that are emerging. So, a cross reactive antibody design, we may uh, use the uh, balance of the affinity, ability, and, uh, the, and the balance, affinity and ability and specificity. And also, we, uh, we need to understand the precise correlation between the antibody activity and clinical outcome. So I would like to summarize the scheme of the cryo-EMM operation at the SARS-CoV-2 research involved in the, uh, the Hokkaido University. The, uh, in Japan, the, uh, there is a very nice consortium, the genotype to phenotype Japan consortium, uh, called as the G2P Japan. Uh, that consortium predicts the new variants. And uh, uh, this information is uh, shared with Kyoto University, Professor Hashiguchi, and uh, he studied uh, uh, he started the recombinant proteins of the new variants. And uh, if possible, uh, if the uh, antibody available from the uh, such as the National Institute of Infection Disease or other universities, we can prepare that uh, uh, complex antibody complex sample. So these samples uh, come to uh, come to Hokkaido University to get the cryoEM data and analysis. And we can successfully and rapidly determine the uh, spike proteins and also neutralizing activity complexes. Next step I would like to mention about that uh, uh, for the crime safety. Uh, so we are very much looking forward to observing the pathogen without inactivation. So structures are expected to close to the, the physiological conditions. So our target is uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, itself. So as I say that uh, we have already set up the uh, 200 kb and 300 kb cloud EM facilities uh, in normal area, but we also established this, uh, uh, the special one, 300 kb clears in the biosafety level three, because we would like to observe the live viruses 
or the value infected cells are in the biosafety level environment. So because the SARS-CoV-2 should be treated in the RBSL3 area. And actually, the, we successfully got the data for the ancestral SARS-CoV-2 in the native active states. This is uh, a cryo-electron tomography analysis, and this is a low data. So till this is, you can see the, the a little bit bumpy images. But if you if we align the images, uh, you can clearly see that the spikes and are in genomes inside the viruses. And the final tomography, this is the cross sections. Uh, you can see the spikes and are in the genome. A query, and this is a reconstituted volume map. You can see the spikes on the top and inside the RNA genome. So I will not talk about the, the, this the, uh, result in detail, but uh, you can find out the, our preprint in this site. So right now, so we successfully go to the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 in active form. And uh, we are now working on the, uh, uh, the antibody complex or the drug complexes. And now we, are, we would like to expand the uh, active pathogen structure. So because it's uh, uh, very few. So our result is the first example of the uh, active pathogen in the BSL-3. Uh, uh, the high resolution structure of the, uh, the BSL3. So we would like to first set up the uh, first created the catalog of the active pathogen structure. And next step, we would like to work on the, the infected cell or infected tissues in the future. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues and also to my collaborators and uh, our grant support. And this is uh, my uh, uh, the colleagues in the photo, and I'm now to, uh, trying to recruit a specially appointed assistant professor or postdocs. In the final slide, I would like to advertise that the uh, 24th annual meeting of Protein Society, uh, Science Society of Japan in Sapporo uh, coming June 11th to 13th in 2024. So if you are interested, please come over. And the uh, abstract is still uh, can be submitted on the website. And I, if you come over, you can join the uh, very good seafood like here. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Maenaka Sensei. So you, we have almost uh, finished at the time. So if you have any questions, if the audience have any questions, please uh, type in uh, Q&A session. So, okay. So, Mayanaka Sensei, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. The last speaker of this webinar is Professor Susumu Chiyama from Osaka University. Uh, he's an expert of molecular biophysics of proteins from bio basic science to applications. Uh, today, he is talking about the biophysical characterization of adeno associated virus vectors for gene therapy. Uh, Professor Uchiyama, please. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. So, uh, let me talk about uh, biophysical characterization of adeno associated virus vector for gene therapy. So, the um, maybe some of you are very fa uh, familiar with gene therapy, uh, but there is two types of gene therapy. One is ex vivo, uh, so the uh, CAR T is very popular, and also there is another type of uh, gene therapy is in vivo, where um, virus, recombinant virus, will be injected to the patient, and. Uh, most uh, promising platform of gene therapy is recombinant adeno associated virus, in which um, uh, there is a um, icosahedral shape capsid, uh, encapsidated DNA inside. And uh, DNA is actually single strand DNA encoding promoter and gene of interest. 
And uh, this is typically capsid is composed of 60 VP proteins. And there is more than 10 types cell type, each have different tissue topologism. And uh, there is already six marketed product, product and also 250 clinical trials is ongoing in the world. This is a mode of action of the adeno-associated virus. So they bind on by they are bound to the, on the surface of the pro, uh, cells, and they are uh, in, uptaken by the uh, endocytosis, and uh, their uh, capsid will be disrupted inside the cell, and our genome inside the capsid will be released in, into the uh, nucleus. And DNA will be finally used for the messenger RNA transcription and the translation to into proteins. And so the uh, very, very important thing is to control the genome content is AV. And because that is determined the efficiency, efficacy of AV-based pharmaceuticals. So how to make AV is at the current stage, so-called triple transfection method is used using HEK293 cells. So the three different plasmids will be co-infected co at the same time and each plasmid coding different uh, proteins. And uh, finally, the cell somehow makes um, recombinant AV viruses. In this case, because however, this is a kind of the, uh, overexpression system. So the cell are not like to make viruses. So the, um, so the frequently, not all, all, only the full particle, which is composed from a capsule protein and DNA, and all, but also empty particle will be generated. Typically, more than 70% is empty particles, and only 30% of the generated uh, capsid will be include only uh, single-strand DNA. And this is a typical cryo-EM picture. Uh, this is taken by 100 kilovolt uh, cryo-EM, and this kind of the, uh, spherical shape of the virus particle can be confirmed. And this is manufacturing process of AV. And uh, as I introduced first, the culture cells and transfection, triple transfection method is used. And after uh, cells sta start to product, produce uh, viruses, and after typically three or four days from the beginning of the transfection, cell will produce enough amount of viruses. And cell will be disrupted and extracted by us. We extracted viruses, and there is several type of purification method, but typically a filtering and chromatographic and density gradient centrifugation or ion exchange chromatography will be used to separate and purify uh, AB recombinant AB viruses. However, there is so many challenges. Why is uh, the AV product is highly mixture even after purification due to similar capsid surface while something inside the capsid. And another challenge is very limited sample yield, almost 10,000, uh, almost one ten thousandth or one, um, 10,000 smaller amount of uh, sample of viruses can be obtained compared to molecular antibody case. So the sample amount we can get is very, very limited. And also virus characterization method, method is very limited, not well established because so far we have not experience of obtaining such a large, uh, I mean the recombinant uh, virus particles. So even after purification, not only full particle, that is composed from the de uh, designed DNA and capsid, but also empty particle are introduced and also partial in particle, which include a pass 
are part of the DNA molecules and also oligomer aggregate and structurally modified um, particle will be also generated and some modification like post-transformational modification and the chemical modification during the purification like deamidation or oxidation will be also occurred. In addition to these um, particle derived impurity, purified particle particle and impurity, impurities, and also DNA fragment, plasmid, host cell proteins will be contaminated. So we need to characterize all these uh, materials inside af uh, after purification, because this is, should be, this is used, the purpose of the purification is we want to use for the clinic uh, pharmaceutical purposes. So the, we need to characterize uh, qualitatively and quantitatively for, to ensure the safety of the patient. And this, so the first, we try to characterize the capsid proteins. So it is said capsid proteins is composed of 60 by VP proteins, and there is three VP proteins. So there is pro, uh, reports that uh, only three prote VP proteins uh, constitute this uh, capsid um, structure. And it is said VP15, VP25, and VP350. This molar ratio is uh, people consider like this. And the VP1 and VP3, VP2 and VP3 share the same structure domain. So meaning VP3 portion is a kind of a structural portion, while VP1 and VP2 is additional uh, and terminal region, which have some function for transgene expression. In fact, VP1 population increase result in the transduction efficiency increase, meaning VP1 have some function because VP1 encodes a PLA domain, which is a, a kind of phospholipase uh, activities, which is necessary to escape from endosome after transfection. So we wanted to characterize, we wanted to know the exact molar ratio of VP1 to N3. So what we did is gel, very typical gel electrophoresis and stained by fluorescent dye. Uh, however, you know the fluorescent dye is preference to amino acid sequence. So very difficult to quantify from gel electrophoresis followed by fluorescent dye uh, staining. So we shifted to capillary gel electrophoresis monitored at UV to, to 14 nanometers. And we have, we believe that this wavelength is the reflection of the peptide bond. However, if we check carefully, recent uh, advancement in protein science, 214 is uh, not only peptide bond, but also side chain of amino acid contribute to the extinction of this uh, wavelength. So we want, we need to know the exact more amino acid composition of the VP1 to N3. However, there is additional peak in addition to VP1 to N3 and unknown peak. So we, we need to identify which, what is this. So the, we did intact MS to know the precise MS of the proteins, VP proteins, and also unknown VP proteins. And also we did peptide mapping as well. So, and we noticed that not only VP3 starting from colonical methionine, but also there is a methionine down at the downstream of the uh, colonical methionine starting codon here. here. So the tip usually uh, VP3 protein is translated from 2,3-O amino acid methionine. However, but also uh, another uh, VP3 variant starting from 211 is also uh, expressed in cell. So the, this was confirmed by peptide mapping uh, digested by trypsin because 
trypsin digest after lysine or arginine. However, we can find the uh, peptide starting from here. Although wh while this is not after lysine or arginine, this such a peptide mapping uh, supports uh, the uh, VP3 variant expression. So this is the mechanism of why VP3 uh, is started from not only two or three uh, canonical uh, methionine, but also there is a methionine downstream of the two or three methionine. So the some ribosome will a uh, so-called leaky scanning mechanism. They um, start from here. But also there is another methionine here. So the some ribosome start from here, may, making an VP3 a little bit shorter VP3 will be ex expressed. In any, anyhow, uh, we could conclude it that VP3, uh, VP quantification is is will be uh, achieved by the combination of capillary zero electrophoresis monitored at 214, and also uh, we need to know the amino acid sequence. And if we can know the amino acid sequence and the composition, uh, we can uh, we can know the extinction coefficient, and that value will be used for the exact molar ratio determination by uh, capillary zero electrophoresis. This is our method we developed. And another method we developed is uh, to characterize full and empty particle ratio. So the, as I explained, not only for a particle, but also empty particle will be generated. And even after purification, always empty particle is included because it's not the, uh, at this moment, still difficult to completely remove an empty particle from full particles. However, empty particle will compete with full particles, which result in the reduce, reduction of efficacy. And also, that, do we need, so the uh, medical doctor have to increase the dose because of the complete uh, compete compete with em empty particle or full particle. So those escalation. It's necessary, but that result in immune immune response. So we need to in any case we need to characterize the percentage of the full particle and the empty particle ratio. So what we do is analytical centrifugation. Maybe you know some of you know well about analytical centrifugation. So the uh, this is very classical analytical centrifugation. And at this moment, there is a very well, uh, I, I, I mean, the modernized analytical ultra centrifugation is available. Uh, and in analytical ultra centrifugation, so the uh, high gravity force, a centrifugal force is applied to the solution. And each particle will be started to sediment. And the sedimentation behavior of the particle is followed by Lam, Lam equation, meaning so the sedimentation coefficient and also diffusion coefficient contribute to the particle sedimentation. And diffusion is proportional uh, to, flic uh, to frictional uh, coefficient. So the, and S value, so this is very famous sedimentation coefficient is proportional to molecular weight, while they are in proportional, uh, 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 reverse proportional to the uh, frictional coefficient. So, but in analytical centrifugation, if we do numerical analysis properly, we can determine S value and D value. From the S value and D value, we can know the molecular weight. If we can properly uh, know, if we know the uh, VIVA value uh, exactly from the experiment. So what we did is the determination of the partial specific volume of uh, empty and full particle by using density construct matching the uh, sedimentation uh, velocity method in which we use deuterium water, heavy water, uh, that that differentiates the um, that changes the water viscosity and also uh, density, and we can know the uh, partial specific volume of the virus particles from which 
we could identify this peak is actually empty particle and this peak is full particles, empty and full particles. And also, we now we could know this is a full particle peak and this is also full particle peak, uh, but monitors at different optics. This is actually refractive index method uh, based observation of the sedimentation be uh, sedimentating particles and also absorbance part, we can see the sedimentation behavior by absorption and by combination of the different wavelengths and also different optics now we can determine the uh, uh, molar extinction coefficient of the each particles meaning in this case, this is empty particle spectrum, or and this is full particle spectrum determined by after separation, uh, during the separation or by the ultra analytical ultra centrifugation. And if we subtract full particle, uh, empty particle spectrum from uh, full particle spectrum, we can know the sub spectrum of the DNA inside the capsid. Likewise. We can know the uh, we now uh, we because we could know the capsid spectrum and DNA spectrum. So if we can get the spectrum of the sedimentated particles, we can and then apply the convolution analysis. We can know the spectrum of the uh, uh, composition of the each particles, and finally we could assign every peak after sedimentation uh, velocity method. In this case, this is full particles and this is empty particles. And this particle is a kind of the partial particles containing 1.1 kilobase fragment DNA is contained in these particles. And also recently we established a method by using density gradient or the centrifugation, analytical the centrifugation in which we can separate the particle uh, according to the particle density, variant density. In this case, we could successfully separate um, empty partial full particle and extra field particles by using analytical centrifugation. But this is not sedimentation velocity. This is density gradient uh, based separation of the particles. That will be very powerful. I will explain later because in this case, this is a typical, very, very typical sedimentation velocity method. And this is full particles. However, we, it seems there is empty and full particles and some extra particles, but this full particle will be separated if we apply this sample to density gradient centrifugation. And so the, what is this full particle? We don't know this. So we wanted to know what is this and this. That kind of things can be achieved by spectrum analysis of the uh, after sedimentation, density gradient sedimentation. So this is, uh, so we have been established a method and from which we could know the uh, this is the main topics of today. So the sometimes full particle is separated into two peaks, like this full particle one and full particle two. And so we suspected why these two particles were separated. So we fractionated by repeating the sediment, a density gradient sedimentation. And first we analyzed DNA contained in these particles and DNA of the two fraction is same length. However, capsid content is slightly different. And so the, this is the uh, capillary gel electrophoresis and only one or two. However, significant difference was con confirmed by VP proteins, VP1 and 2. And that was supported by charge mass spectrometry, charge detection mass spectrometry, meaning lower density capsid have higher molecular mass because of the VP1 and VP2 proteins is much, much larger amount compared to the uh, heavier particles. 
An important thing is uh, VP1 and VP2 proteins increment result in the high efficacy of the par uh, virus particles. So this result means that we need to accurately determine the VP1, VP2, and VP3 molar ratio because they are highly correlated to the function of the virus particles. So this is a, a conclusion at this moment. So the v, if the VP protein increases, relative infectivity increases. So we have to know the VP, uh, we have to determine precisely the number of VP proteins com constituting uh, VP uh, virus proteins. The reason of the VP1 and VP2 is important because there is a functional domain. VP1 encodes a PLA domain and also the nuclear nu nuclear slide localizing signal is located VP at the VP2. So the VP number is very, very important. So this is a quick summary and uh, we can now characterize the AV particle very, very precisely. In addition to the uh, already introduced method, we have routinely analyzed uh, full and empty classification by cryoEM combined with uh, neural network analysis and also direct mass technology that is charge detection mass to determine the particle molecular mass. And also we are routinely do doing HDXMS for the AV structural dynamics analysis. And also, we are now uh, having manufacturing facility in our laboratory and everyday manufacturing routinely and purification and the characterization. And so, so far, we have successfully established the manufacturing facility and analytical QC facility. So now we are doing the collaboration with the hospital in our university and also other universities. So the new pipeline will, will be come to our facility and we are vector manufacturing. And manufactured vector will be QC by ourselves. And also that manufactured virus vectors will be uh, done, will be clinical trial in a hospital. And finally, that clinical, uh, after initial clinical trial, the um, seed or pipeline will be out, uh, moved to a biotech company or CDMO for more further development of other pharmaceutical product. That is now we are doing in our university. This is a final uh, slide. It's uh, almost everything is done in Osaka Uni University collaboration with our uh, my uh, CRO company and uh, uh, financially assist, uh, so supported from the Japanese government AMED research grant. Thank you for your kind uh, attention today. Thank you, Uchiyama san. So it's almost at that time to the end of this webinar. But if you, so this, do, can we have some time to have a general discussions? Okay, so if the I audience- think a little would be just fine because I think uh, this has been just an amazing, beautiful presentation of sort of a breadth of science that I think is very exciting for our future. So I think uh, just a, a quick question or two. I mean, I guess I have maybe one, which is, um, you know, in in all of this virus work, of course, proteins are a part of this, RNA is a part of this, and we're understanding more fundamental as well as applied aspects. I guess a question I have is, where could maybe also protein engineering or pro protein, you know, manipulation contribute here, right? Changing our proteins. Of course, we mutate them and see what mutants do, mutant proteins do. But um, it's sort of a big general question that I think touches on multiple of what the topics we were hearing about. I don't know if anyone wants to comment. Because I think we need to engineer, maybe, maybe it will also help to engineer the proteins to make uh, the adenovirus particles so that they work better. Maybe it will be important also then in understanding how we target antibodies to these viruses, also how we understand how they interact with RNA. I mean, it's there's sort of a, a lot of connections. 
How do you think about it, Chiyama san? So the, yeah, so the, I'm more engineering aspect, biotechnology aspect. So the, so many people is trying to research and like a drug development to increase the efficacy and like a, a specificity or I mean the target specificity. However, I strongly want to say we need to manufacture. We need to make a large amount of proteins, which means even very high specificity. That is, if the proteins or virus is very difficult to make a large amount, usually uh, that can, it will not be successful. So the important point of the from the beginning of the drug development, we need to consider the manufacturability, meaning or drug developability. So, so the yeah, the protein. I mean the solubility and also protein. I mean the dispersion state, and also if the protein is very stable, structurally stable, that kind of thing is very important from the beginning of the research development, research and R and D stage. Yeah, I want to strongly yeah uh, ask the um this basic researcher to do more. I mean the stable make the stable <laughs> proteins or more. I mean the soluble proteins. <laughs> yeah, that means that maybe we don't we need to know the the characteristics of the molecule itself. <laughs> so everyone yeah. on this field may work on that. Okay. Any other comments? If not, I think yeah. it's time to put the this way me down. Yeah, okay. but I would like to I would like to just say again, Arigato. Um <laughs> and thank you. I think this was very exciting and I'm really excited about the future of what we can all do together when I see what's happened uh, in this kind of molecular study of proteins and complex assemblies and how they work as enzymes and how I have many questions. So I look forward one day to exploring them more with you. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank also our uh, our audience and Raluca and Shannon, and uh, I wish you all a good night. <laughs> thank <laughs> you very much. You. I want to thank um, all the people, all the, all the audience and speakers and Raluca and Shannon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Yeah. Goodbye. I'll see Thanks. you. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.